Well, Doug Van Koenig is here to help us. Doug's expertise in sales and sales coaching is extensive. We are really lucky to have him today. And without further ado, Doug, hey, take it away. Okay, thanks, Julie. Hey, and again, to add the thanks that Julie gave us, I really appreciate everybody joining today. And um, just a background on me, I've been uh, in business, uh, sales and marketing for about 30 years. I've actually been using the value selling framework for close to 20 years, and I've actually been teaching it for close to 10 years. So that's the experience level that I'm going to leverage to help you understand how to make the best use out of your credibility introduction. And that said, you know, you typically hear sales professionals uh, talk about, you know, one of the things I've got to do is gain that trusted advisor status. Um, I've got to make sure that all the people that can make the decisions on whether to buy from me and my company or not trust me. And uh, I would suggest that that has to start with the very first contact you have with them. So yes, you're going to aspire to that trusted advisor status that you're going to earn over time, but it starts the moment you start speaking with them. So if you think about it, all of those senior executives that we're trying to get to vote for us, if you will, buy our products and services, they're extremely busy. They are under a lot of time pressures. Um, they are very careful and judicious with who they give their time to. And I know that to be able to close the deal or the sales cycle, I want to lead with them. I've got to come across as very credible, believable, trustworthy, reliable, and plausible somebody they, AKA somebody they want to invest time with uh, right from the get-go. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is how do I do that? And if you think about it, how many chances do we get to make a good first impression with the people that we meet for the first time? So I just gave you the answer, right? Um, we get exactly one chance to be able to do that and we've gotta make sure we get it right. So. Um, we've also got some stigmatisms going into that conversation. Um, a lot of executives or the senior decision makers aren't always too excited to be able to talk to somebody with sales in their title. And that's because there's so many, in my opinion, unprofessional or average salespeople out there. And senior executives will not give their time to average salespeople. So you can probably find that as well, not because you're that way, but just because we go in, we have sales in our title, and they're kind of looking for their glasses at us a little bit. And just for a little humor, sales, uh, stigmatism, what my friends think I do, party, what my mom thinks I do, leading the free world to salvation, of course, right? What, my, what society thinks I do, and here's the one hitting it right on the head. Society thinks that I was selling used cars last week before I came to work for the company I'm working at today. So I need to overcome that. Keeping going, what my customers think I do, count their money. Uh, what I think I do is I'm hurting cats all the time, right? And what I really do is I sweat every detail in the sales cycle because at the end of the day, I've got a quota to attain and there's never enough time to do it. So let's focus on that stereotype that power the senior decision makers already think I bring to the cycle is that used car salesperson uh, persona. So, um, and by the way, it gets a little worse. Not only are they already thinking that of me, so I need to disprove it quickly, uh, but there's a law of the jungle, law of physics, um, that we can't change, and it's simple, something we've simply got to work with. Power senior executive is judging me. I'm auditioning if you will, for 30 seconds, uh, they're gonna make a decision, 30 seconds of their interface with me, the very first 30 seconds of their interface with me, they're gonna make a decision, is this a go or no-go person? Are they gonna wanna keep talking to me or are they not gonna wanna talk to me? And this is first contact, right? So it's the first 30 seconds of the conversation. Uh, I need to grab it, I need to have the right wording to say to get the attention of that senior decision maker. And by the way, I'm going to use this with everybody I meet with the first time, but it's particularly judicious. The senior executives tend to be very, very focused on um, where that 30 second absolutely matters. And 
bottom line is what we're going to learn about today is I need to own it like a boss. Um, and we're going to learn how to do it, what to say, and how we move forward. But first contact, 30 seconds, I've got to make sure I dominate it. And in that short amount of time, this is not fair. It's just the way it is. In that very short amount of time, I've got to make sure that they understand I am somebody that can add value to their world and that they want to interface with. So if I get it right, great. I get to continue. You know, they decide, okay, Doug, I'm willing to continue speaking with you. Now I get to start moving through my sales cycle. Uh, however, the flip side is if I get it wrong, I'm done, right? I need their vote. I need their support to be able to sell the products and services my company wants to talk to them about that I want to talk to them about. And like I said, if I get it right, they're going to want to talk to me. If I get it wrong, they're, I'm done and they're not going to want to talk to me. Now what do I do? I've killed the sales cycle. I move on to something else. So um, there's two parts we're going to talk about today. That initial 30-second contact, that's the pressure point for me, the professional salesperson. I've got to get that right. And then I'm going to swing back around. So it worked, right? They let me in. We're going to have a meeting. When I meet them for the first time, uh, whether that's in person or over the phone, doesn't matter. Um, I also want to make sure that I anchor that credibility so that my 30-second credibility got me in the door. As soon as I meet with power for the first time, I'm going to anchor that credibility to make sure that we're well on that way to quickly and accelerating um, that quest for trusted advisor status. Um, so the way I'm going to do that is, first one is going to be my credibility introduction. We'll talk about that in a second. The two-minute version is simply adding that second credibility introduction to uh, be able to really make sure I've cemented the relationship we move forward. We'll talk about how to do that in a second. So here's what Value Selling believes in our more than two decades in business. We pay a lot of attention to this, and I'm sure you guys would agree with this. We only get one chance to make a good first impression. Rule of the jungle says the more senior the person, the less time we have to do that. And I want to make sure that I'm connecting with people for the first time on that 30-second time clock so I can absolutely ensure I gain that senior decision maker's initial attention. And when I get to the second meeting or the first meeting, I've got to make sure that I actually anchor that credibility so they'll continue to want to engage with me. And again, starting my journey well on the way to becoming that trusted advisor. So what we're going to learn today, we're actually going to learn how to create the credibility introduction. What is it? What's the content? What are the words? Um, we're going to talk about best practices. So um, how do I get power? Again, the senior decision maker when I say that to agree to the first meeting. Um, how do I anchor my credibility? That two minute thing we just talked about when I get in front of power. And how do I transition from that credibility introduction to talking about power's top challenge, right? Because good sales cycle means that I'm finding out what they are trying to solve in their world. And how do I use my credibility introduction as the segment to, or the transition to be able to have that conversation? And how do I leverage this process for effective prospecting? And um, we'll also talk to you about how do I adapt it to different types of clients, verticals, or markets, meaning it's got to sound, it's got to resonate. The words I use have got to resonate with them. And they're, if they're in different markets or different verticals, um, I've got to make sure I've tailored that to them. And uh, as we go through this, um, we'll talk about how we adapt it to both sales and marketing and also questions fire at will. So you've got the question X asking capability on the web tool. And at this point, I'm going to pause. Uh, Julie's kind of my adult supervision today. Julie, do we have any questions that we should answer at this point? Yeah, we just we just have one. Um, is this just for first meetings, Doug? Well, so are we only... when I say first meeting, no, when I say first meeting, I actually mean first contact. So if the person asking that question means, well, so I've met one person, they're taking me to the next person. I use a credibility introduction and I recommend you do it for first contact with the person. So it's not actually the meeting per se when we talk about the 30 second part. It's actually how do I get them interested enough that they want to talk to me? So hopefully that answered the question. I I believe so. Any others, Thank Julie? You. No, that's it. Keep keep them coming. 
Okay, yep, keep them coming. We'll answer them. And if there's any left over, we've also got time at the end of the session today uh, for additional questions. So do our best to answer all of them. Okay, so the other thing I'll do is we don't have enough time on the session today to actually have you build out your own credibility introduction, uh, but you're going to be able to download the slides at the end of the session. And I will offer to personally review your credibility introduction. So um, grab the slides, use the ones I'm going to show you that I do for my credibility introduction uh, to model your credibility introduction. I'll show you the parts that need to be there and how I use the words. And then if you just want to email it to me, um, I will pretty quickly critique it, send it back to you. And that will also go for any of the prospecting pieces we're going to touch on lately. So if you've got a question and you think that value selling could help you answer it, um, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to respond to you. Okay, so let's talk about creating your credibility introduction. What is this thing? What's it sound like? So um, what power wants to hear with that, I, I, and again, just to clarify, I use the word power. I'm talking about that senior decision maker in your sales cycle. Uh, but it also applies to everybody you're going to meet for the first time. So what they want to hear is that you've done this before, you've done it for another client that they can relate to, and you've already solved the problems similar to the ones I've got for that other um, person. And what was the value? What was the financial reward that their business received from having leveraged your products and services? So again, just real quick, basically that it's not our first rodeo. We've done it before. And the story you're going to tell them is this 30 second story is basically the content about who that other client was, whether you can name them or not, or just describe what their business is, that's fine. But that you solved a top challenge for them. It should be similar to the top challenge you believe your prospective client has. And you're gonna talk about what was the reward that their company received. In other words, what was the financial improvement or the metrics that they measured about the engagement with you, how they got the improvement. Okay, so here's the parts that your credibility introduction is going to have. Um, it's got to start with who you are and what you do. It's got to start with the challenge you solve for the other company that should resonate with them. It, if you've got time in your 30 second chunk, because you're going to time this to yourself, right? Um, what were the top one or two problems um, that you needed that you solved for them? And what was the value that they received as a result of that? And this is actually the one that I use. Remember, I'm selling a uh, value selling when I'm using this, our methodology and process. So I start out with, who am I? Doug Von Koenig. I'm a partner for value selling. And our company accelerates business results. Um, the top challenge the customer I picked for this particular example was a top polymer company. Not allowed to use their name in public, so I just described them. And they were struggling to achieve revenue goals. Um, they had the top one to two problems they had were they had forecast issues, too many stalled deals, and their overall pipeline was too low to support their revenue requirements. By leveraging value selling, they were able to reduce their stalled sales by 30%. Their qualified pipeline grew by 3x within six months. And they said that this was worth over $28 million to them in that same time frame. So remember that the customer prospective client I'm calling on is likely a VP of sales, a senior VP of sales and marketing, what have you, some senior executive that's on a quota and struggling to make that quota. So obviously I did a little bit of research. I found out in their earnings report that you know revenue is up, but margins are down or the inverse of that. And I reached out to them because I believe my products and services in my company could help them solve those problems but I need a way to establish credibility quickly in the initial contact. And what I did was, was use the story from another client, a success story from another client to help them understand that I've done this before and that's why I am asking for time on their calendar. And if you take a look at, that's the same chunks right below at the bottom. If you take a look at what I did say, we should ask the question, what did I not say? And what am I intentionally leaving out at this point? You'll notice that in my 30 second part statement there, I'm gonna show you how I actually say it in a second. I did not talk about our products and services at all. And the reason I did not do that is because at this point, literally power does not care. 
They are judging exclusively who is this person that's trying to reach out to me. And by the way, this works the same whether you're doing it via email or direct phone call, however you're communicating with them, works the same way. But if I started talking about my products and services before I started connecting seriously to their top challenges and the problems they've got, I'm going to come across as pitchy. And like I said, more importantly, at this point in the engagement, power does not care yet about what my products and services are. They just want to hear about what that story was and how I solved it for somebody else. And this is actually how I say it. So power, my name is Doug Von Koenig with Value Selling Associates. We help companies accelerate their business results. I read in your earnings report that you're struggling with margin, or you're struggling with revenue, whatever it was I read. It reminded me of another, another client, a top polymer company who was struggling to achieve revenue goals. They had forecast issues, meaning too many stalled deals, and their overall pipeline was too low. By working with value selling, they were able to reduce stalled sales by 30% and at the same time grow their qualified pipeline 3x within the first six months. They told me this was worth over $28 million to them in that time. And I'll pause right there. That's where the 30 second clock stops. So the, the credibility story where I described that success story with the value piece in there from another client is where my allowance on the 30 seconds is. And I want to transition it, though, as to why did I even bother to tell them that story. And I add this part, but I just want to be clear, this part in white does not necessarily count towards your 30 seconds as you time this out to yourself. The, the text above in black does. And so I'll just add to it, Power, the reason I'm asking for time on your schedule is to see if there's an opportunity for similar success in your organization. And by the way, so now I'm transitioning to starting to talk about what their top challenges are. And a lot of team members, when I train uh, in workshops, tell me, well, I'm kind of stuck on how do I actually open that conversation? And what they're really asking me is, I can't just walk in and, and meet the senior person and say, can you tell me what your top challenges are? Because it sounds like I haven't done any research on them. I haven't investigated them at all. And so I chose my story, the part I said above in the black text. I chose that based on the initial research I did about them, right? What are, what's their company doing? What can I see in the earnings report? If they're publicly traded, a lot of information in those reports. If they're not, there's press releases and a lot of other ways to easily find um, that kind of information. But I need to get them teed up to want to talk about what their top challenges is. That's what, So second uh, reason I use my credibility reduction is to start that conversation. So the reason I'm asking for time on your schedule is to see if there's an opportunity for similar success in your organization. And power is that, did that story I just tell you resonate with you? And are these challenges similar to your top challenges? And can we start, can we schedule time to discuss what those are, please? So again, this is my initial contact. I'm trying to get them interested. I've got 30 seconds to do it. And I'm asking specifically for time on their schedule. I came out, do this right, which is basically the words on the screen. And they're going to want to talk to me because what they heard was this guy or gal has taken the time to research about me. They, they, they're telling me about how they've solved some really big things that I'm also struggling with for this other company. And I want to learn how they did that because maybe it'll help me. So this is the voice version, right? So if I'm talking to them on the phone um, or I bumped into them somewhere, I mean, this is what I would do voice to voice. The version for email, which I'm showing you now, is pretty similar. Um, and by the way, personally, what I like to do, I prefer to send an email. And you see at the bottom the piece I added about the um, reason I'm asking for time on your schedule is an opportunity for success. That's the same. But I'll just, I like to schedule it and say, okay, I'm going to call you next Monday at 8 a.m. If there's a better time, please let me know. And then I'll calendar that in my uh, Outlook and make sure I follow up with the call. I don't always expect to get them, but we'll talk about that in the prospecting piece in a little bit. But this works as well, whether I'm doing it uh, via email or voice to voice. The process remains the same. I've tested it to make sure it fits in the 30 minute, or I'm sorry, 30 second window that I've got. And I just changed that little part at the bottom um, to transition it. So voice is that way, email is that way, and we move through it. Okay, so again, I'm gonna pause just for a second. 
Julie, do we have any other questions that we might want to address at this time? You know what, Doug, we do. We have one from Kelly Sue. And here's a question. Are there any differences in this approach depending on if you sell a physical product versus a software or service? Oh, that is an awesome question. So Kelly, in the workshops, we, we uh, pay cards. We're playing poker during the workshops, right? So I'd be throwing cards at you right now. Uh, nice question. So it, it's independent of what your products and services are. So you're going to take a story that is from your company, a success story that's from your company. So obviously it's going to involve your products and services. And I mean, our world in value selling is any B2B client could be using and probably should be using value selling. So it, it doesn't, the approach doesn't change the content of the success story, perhaps a little bit, but again, you're going to customize that by your choice of the words you use and the story, the story you use so that it's, it's emulating what that other client is. So uh, if I'm selling software as a service, I'm selling applications, I'm selling whatever, uh, versus um, you know maybe I'm selling um, concrete or uh, steel. It actually doesn't matter what, what I'm selling, the process stays exactly the same. Power's ears wanna hear that you've solved the problem. So it's not, I'll actually put this in, it's not so much about the products and services, it's actually about the problems those products and services solve, and you're going to weave it in so it's unique for your company and how you're doing that. Uh, but again, that's a little further on the sales cycle. But uh, so, Kelly, I'm going to go. Uh, no, this process absolutely is not dependent on the product or service, just that it would be in a B2B environment, um, and uh, you can use it literally everywhere in a B2B environment. So, Julie, hopefully that passed mustard. You got any other questions? You know what, we have um, we, we have quite a few, but let's take one more. Um, and this one's okay. from Steve. What would you use for a subject line in an email to grab their attention? Oh, oh Steve, love that question. You also get cyber cards. So <clears throat> think about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch into the prospecting piece a little bit. Um, cold calling is dead. I would contend it has never worked. It certainly doesn't work today. And by cold calling, I mean that you just blindly reached out to somebody without anybody helping you to do that. Um, and they're pretty busy. So what we tend to find in value selling's world is that um, the higher up the org chart I am, if you're reaching out to senior decision makers to start, um, that's not ever going to work. I mean, we've actually got some charts that people research this and, and that one's got a never works at all. Don't even do it. And I want to turn that cold call into a warm call. And real quick, what I mean by that is, I'm going to have found somebody uh, either within their domain, which is ideal, but somebody that's going to refer or forward my email to them so it's more recognizable. And um, at that point, if I can get a referral from somebody they understand, that's actually what's going to be the subject line. You know, um, this guy, Doug Bonconig, who they know is suggesting they take a look at the email because all I'm trying to do is get the visibility. So. I'm not deep dive in the answer, but when we talk about the prospecting materials we've got available to you, we define that to a very granular level of detail of how you turn that cold calling idea into warm calling to make sure that you're actually getting through the cyber traps so they actually see it. So the subject line ideally would be, um, Doug Von Koenig asked me to reach out or a referral from uh, Julie Bragan, something like that. So the name they recognize so they don't treat you as spam. Great question. And again, we'll ask more as we go along. So just to summarize the best practices on your credibility introduction, you're going to use your credibility introduction every time you meet somebody new, um, period. In a business environment, you're just doing it all the time, even if you're being introduced from somebody on Power's team. So you started in the middle. You've got a manager was your entry point. They like what you had to say. You used your credibility introduction when you introduced yourself to them. They like what you had to say. They're going to take you into, let's say, the director level position, who's the next person on the decision making org chart. Uh, even though they're holding you by the hand and taking you in for the introduction, you absolutely will introduce yourself to that person, like we just talked about using your 30 second credibility introduction and explaining why you asked for time on their schedule. So, again, just reinforcing we do this all the time, all the time. Um, even if they reached out to your company first. So, you're following up on a lead that came to you, 
because they reached out and said, hey, we're interested in talking to your company about this, that, and the other thing. Doesn't matter. You still will introduce yourself using your credibility introduction. So just, again, reinforcing that all the time mode we're in with this. And um, I'm going to use both. I advise using both email and voicemail uh, follow-up or vice versa. It's always exactly the same content. But, um, you know, if you like to call first and leave a message or what have you, guess what? The content is your credibility introduction. If you like to uh, do an email first and follow up afterwards via voice like I do, um, it's always going to be the same content. So that credibility reduction uh, serves all ways of doing those. Um, and the other thing is uh, just one of those tips is that um, have your credibility in front of you when you're calling. Uh, what I mean is don't try to do it from memory. Uh, picture this. You're calling in and you're generally expecting to get voicemail calling power or the person you're trying to reach out to. And all of a sudden they answer the phone and you were expecting the voicemail and you stumble a little bit. Oh, geez, you answered your phone. Uh, yeah, that's usually what I do when it rings. I mean, you don't, you don't want to have that be your first impression. So even though I've been doing this for decades, I just have it in front of me. It's not scripted. It's the word, just my notes to remind me. Um, the other situation that we run into from time to time that we teach in classes, you know, what if it's a really long pause between when the, it says who they are, but the beep takes longer to get to you than you expect. You're sitting there waiting for it. It takes them a second longer than you expect. And all of a sudden, the next thing you've got to do after you leave that message pops into your head and you forget what you're going to say next. Oops, uh, geez. Oh, okay, yeah, here's why I was calling. You, you don't want that to be your first impression, right? Because you only get one chance to do it. So the thing I, I teach and beg people to do is have it in front of you uh, when you're calling. It's the same content as an email. And you need to customize it to be vertical market specific. So what I mean by that is if you're calling into a healthcare organization, I probably wouldn't want to use a credibility reduction where I helped a aircraft manufacturing company, for instance, um, solve some big challenges, the problems, et cetera. I would want to use something from healthcare because the gap is too big for them to uh, have the story resonate with them. So I would just want to make sure um, that I'm being vertical specific, which means if you sell across multiple verticals and different types of customers, guess what? You're going to have different credibility introductions that you use because we want to get this as close to their world as we possibly can. Again, I'm going to make the offer again at the end of the webinar, but I'll be happy to critique your one or many uh, credibility introductions if you want to make sure you just get them right. And again, the ID gap is too far if I go from different verticals. Okay, so um, that's the 30 second version. Uh, let's move into the how do I anchor it once I got there? So my 30 second version worked. Congratulations. Power has said, yes, I want to talk to you. You sound interesting to me. And I want to hear more about that other company you helped because yes, I am struggling with those same problems. Very awesome. It works all the time. So now I got to power. I'm physically in the meeting and you can adopt this, whether it's the next phone call, whatever, it doesn't matter whether you're face to face or in person. Um, but I've got to anchor my credibility and I've got two minutes to do that. So big difference between the 30 second version and the two minute version is the 30 second version, I'm on the clock for the first 30 seconds of contact. So I've kind of, I've got to grab that 30 seconds. So I can't let power start chit chatting or I don't ask them how they're doing today because that's wasting time. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting off track from my credibility reduction. So first contact, I built out my 30 second um, credibility introduction and I go through the process. Um, when I get to the meeting, the, the two minute version is more relaxed. It's the two minutes that I get to do speaking wise. So I'm not in a hurry to dominate the conversation. Power is gonna say, you know, talk to me a little bit about some things. Maybe there's a picture of a sailboat on their desk they wanna brag about, Wh whatever it is. Uh, it's the two minutes of me uh, talking and driving the conversation. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my the first credibility introduction I did. Um, and I'm going to I just like to you know, I'm gonna spend the majority of the time today talking about you and your business and just a quick introduction about what my company does. They may not know. Right. And I make no assumptions in the process. So these next two slides are kind of describing how that two minutes goes. 
So introduce them, remind them who I am. Thanks for taking the thanks for taking the meeting. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about you, the problems you've got, the challenges you've got to achieve, etc. Um, but just I want to take a quick pause. And I'm not doing a 30 minute dissertation on what my company does. I just want to make sure they have a rough idea of what we do. And so let me just take a minute, if I can, to explain a little bit about what we do for what Value Selling does. We're in the business of helping companies methodically accelerate their business by shortened sales cycles, and improving margins. Reminder that my audience that I'm using this with is a VP of sales, senior VP of sales and marketing, or perhaps the president of the company. And when they hear somebody talk to them who has already established credibility, that I'm in the business of helping companies do these things, they're all ears and they're paying attention. Then I simply say, I remind them about that, um, you know, how, how I can add in perhaps a unique part of what we do. For us, we call it a value prompter, but it's a single page uh, probing question based tool set um, that really helps the sales team um, uh, get 30% more productivity out of their world. It usually gives them a 10% revenue increase. So I'm just embellishing some of the value that we typically bring to clients. And then I'm going to add that I already talked about my top polymer company and the results they achieved. And then I'm simply going to add in a second one. And by the way, Power, in the time between we last talked, it made me think of a second customer. And this other customer, Leverage Value Sun, to launch their enterprise business, realized a 23% attach rate within six months. That was worth over $100 million to them. And I just now I'd like to start moving into talking about their world and what's going on. Uh, in terms of what they've got to do for the current fiscal year, what have you, and can we talk about the problem staying in the way? And this answers that question that a lot of sales team members ask me about, Doug, how do I open that door the first time to get the senior people talking about the things that are obstacles for them, their goals for the year, and then I can work my sales cycle so I'm starting to connect to those things. These are the way to do that. So again, you can download the slides and get it, but it, it just gives you that cadence. And we know that this is what appeals to power from how they want to hear things. It's lining up to the way they think. And the conversation, again, the whole point of doing this is I want to come across as very credible. I want to move myself well along on that journey to become that trusted advisor. And these are the steps that we recommend and teach on how to do that. And, and they work all the time. I mean, it's just, it's amazing when you get good at this and it doesn't take very long at all um, to how well power will respond to this. Because guess what? We're not in there pitching our products and services, telling them about how great our company is. It's about how we've solved these big challenges that they likely have for somebody else. So we've got the experience to be relevant to them. And all I want to do is talk about their challenges. I don't want to talk about my company yet because how would I know even what to propose for a solution, even if I wanted to do that, which you don't, but how would I even know? I haven't found out enough about what's going on in their world at all. So um, just wanna make sure we're good on that. And again, Julie, I'm just gonna pause real quick if we got any questions I should answer. You know, we do actually, we have quite a few. So why don't we just take one and then uh, we'll answer the others at the end of, of this webinar. So what, so going back to, you know, Doug, we were talking about the emails. So Chris is asking, what is your ratio of emails to scheduled calls appointments? So this is, I believe, is on the prospecting. Okay. So I'm um, Chris, again, a great question. I'd be throwing cyber cards at you. Um, so you're asking about the success rate of how well this works. I'm going to adapt the answer a little bit to the prospecting cadence that we recommend and how we go about that. And it's back to that other answer I gave a few minutes ago about cold calling versus warm calling. So I will suggest that if I simply send an email to power directly and I did not engage that uh, friend of a friend on LinkedIn or somebody that's willing to forward it to them on my behalf, uh, I'm not going to get anywhere because it's going to get killed in the cyber traps, right? Uh, especially the more senior they are, either their admin killed it their spam filters killed it, it probably never got to them. And so the actual process we follow and I use myself is I'm looking for that warm referral. And again, it's not anybody that's got to vouch for me or say great things about me. If you've got that, awesome, leverage it. But 
it's just somebody that's got to be willing to forward the email that's my credibility introduction email to forward it on to power for me and all i'm doing is doubling up on the chances that my email got through um, i'm not going to deep dive it right now but again we're going to give you the content for how we prospect and how we leverage the value selling framework and this credibility introduction to do that so that's coming up but basically if so the answer i'm going to give you is specifically this if I don't, if I do cold calling where I'm just sending the email, I'm going to go with a zero percentage chance of working because it just doesn't work. There's a pile of statistics to back that up. However, if I can elevate it up to that warm referral process, it's north of 85%. So if you're thinking about, you know, what's the resource none of us can get more of time, cold calling, you want to keep doing that. Uh, you're going to have a zero percent chance of success in our opinion. Um, why would you do that? I'll spend the extra time to find somebody that will actually forward the email for me um, and drive it accordingly. So that's my answer there. Julie, you got any others? Yeah, why don't we take one more? Um, and this is from Javier. And uh, he's asking, Doug, does this approach, you know, could this approach be used for connecting with customers uh, on LinkedIn? Uh, absolutely. So, Again, you just want to, I think LinkedIn in the last few years, because we use it too, I use it. Um, I think that the same rules apply, right? So people are starting to, I don't want to say, excuse me, I don't want to say overuse LinkedIn, but I, you get a lot of messages from a lot of people. So that's almost the same, excuse me, pardon me, that's almost the same as getting too many emails that aren't vetted or referred so what i would tend to do on linkedin is still follow that friend of a friend process to get somebody to call their attention to it all i'm trying to do is get past that initial you know i got this email from this guy named doug von Kona guy i have no idea who he is i'm not going to read it because that decision gets made pretty quick all the time however i got the email i got a mention about that email from this person named julie bregan who i actually do know and since Julie's a little closer to my tribe, I'm going to read that email. And what I did, I was smart enough to ask Julie to forward my email through LinkedIn. So it's on the bottom of that message. And I would re replicate that process all day long. I just need to find that warm referral person that they're going to respond to better than me, someone they don't know. Excellent question. Cyber cards for Xavier as well. Okay. And again, we'll take some more questions at the end. But Let's talk about adopting this to sales and marketing. So again, same process. Who are you? What do you do? Sales that you solved. This is kind of a review from a sales standpoint. That you solved a top business challenge for an organization similar to mine. So content of your credibility introduction. What were the top two connected problems if you have time to build that into your 30-second time allowance? And what financial impact value did they receive from leveraging you and your company and your services and your um, excellent advice that you gave them. Okay, so that's from a sales standpoint. Let's talk about how we leverage this in a marketing standpoint or viewpoint. Who are you are, you're gonna have exactly the same content. Those slides are identical, and I'm not trying to be cute when I do that, but if you think about how do I connect my differentiated products and services and capabilities <clears throat> to helping clients solve um, the problems that they've got, and because they're leveraging my company, they can do it better than if they buy from a competitor. That is as much a sales mission as it is a marketing mission. So um, if there's marketing folks on the line, you definitely want to adopt the same process into your marketing messages, because first contact is first contact. So um, use that credibility introduction uh, structure to leverage into your um, uh, marketing messages as well, and it's basically the exact same approach. So if a company masters this, it serves both sides of the house, and now we've got a single version of the truth marching forward from uh, sales and marketing to grow share within your client and prospective client base. Hope that makes sense. Um, from a marketing sentence standpoint, we recommend using both the 30-second and two-minute versions in the same messaging. So like I said, for the two-minute one is the one you can model. Um, same as with the sales side, the 30-second version is highlighted to gain that initial interest. The expanded version comes right after that. So a couple of ways to go about that in a marketing process, you know, one-two punch type of thing. Um, and the marketing message to strongly come across is that 
my company is the world's best problem solver. So if you're a marketing professional and you're hearing this right now and you're feeling a little guilty that perhaps your marketing messages are too product centric, um, the, the shift you want to make that will benefit you greatly is start talking about the product problems that your products and services actually solve and start tuning that to the target audience you're trying to um, get interested. So the message would be a little bit different between a CIO, let's say, versus trying to target a VP of sales and marketing, because those two folks do different things. But if they could both leverage your products and services, the message just needs to adopt, the storytelling just needs to adopt to both of those two different personas. And to me, that's kind of the prize for all the executives is, well, if you can get your, you know, a lot of times through a sales cycle, we will ask uh, power. So as I'm leading the sales cycle, I'll ask the senior VP of sales, if, and if he, does, he or she doesn't have marketing, that's cool, but I'll ask them, how well has your company in its marketing messages defined what makes you unique? And how well have they defined the problems that you should be solving uniquely, you know, better than anybody else for your clients? And a lot of times that is actually well-defined. I'm like, cool. So we've got a foundation to work from. And then the next question I ask usually involves some sobbing on the executive's part. Obviously, I just a little bit, but usually where the gap is, is I'll ask them the second part of the question. How well does the sales team deliver that message in with the client so the client gets a clear understanding of how your company can best solve, uniquely solve via your differentiated capabilities, the problems that that client's going to agree they have based on how your sales team dialogues with them to the point, because the, the litmus test is, is your team able to charge a reasonable premium to the market based on how well they're doing that? And that's usually the point of discussion where we start discussing that there's gaps and how do we go correct those and how do we bring everybody's performance up, et cetera. And remember, all of this started with that 30 second credibility introduction. So when I said earlier that I believe personally that that 30 second credibility introduction is the meaning of life in a professional sales and marketing existence, that's why. So um, and we'll get to our big question section here in a second. So now I'm gonna switch over to the prospecting piece. Um, we've got the prospecting process that we use um, defined uh, down to some pretty granular activities. None of it's hard, it's pretty straightforward. As you can imagine, it all starts with a good credibility introduction, the 30 second version uh, and the two minute version. Um, but it starts with adopting the fact that those people that can become really good at prospecting are precious ed, uh, resources for a company because most people don't like to do it. And not everybody is able to become um, uh, enamored with doing it, but if you do it right, it takes the pressure off of it and you'll start seeing good results. Why do people get frustrated with prospecting? Because they're doing a bunch of activity related stuff, but they're not seeing the related results for it. And it tends to um, you know, lose the luster. So I'm not doing a deep dive. I've touched on it today, but we do, we do whole webinars on this. And um, there's some good content that you can follow our process that we go through. And it, this is just the high level eight steps that we recommend. The webinar that's on our website that you can download is very detailed on this. And again, I can't, I don't have enough time today to go through this. It's a whole a webinar on its own. But not only will I offer to critique your credibility introductions, uh, if you want me to, just email them to me. I'll give you my comments, send it right back. Uh, if you want to download this content uh, and take a look at it, I'd also answer questions on anything we talked about today, and I'm happy to answer anything about the um, uh, prospecting process we recommend as well, because they're tied hand in hand. 